one thing to say, we're all still here. That's right, amen. <laughs> we haven't gone anywhere. And, uh, you know, unbeknownst to me, when I put this message together, I was going to explain where people get confused about the word apocalyptic. And, of course, we know that one of the reasons that people are saying that today supposedly is the end of the world and the judgment of God is going to hit and people are going to be cast into a everlasting conscious torment, mainly because the evangelical Christian church has interpreted this word apocalyptic as meaning the end. And they have no understanding, obviously, that in Isaiah chapter 46 and verse 10, it says these words, declaring the end from the beginning, declaring the end from the beginning, and from ancient times the things not yet done, saying, my counsel shall stand and I will do all my pleasure. Now, as I said, one of the reasons that we hear people setting dates and and saying, uh, you know, the end of the world is going to happen and the judgment of God and the four blood moons and all of this stuff is because they have looked at that word apocalyptic mm -hmm. and they have made it just about the end. Mm -hmm. Just about the end. Mm -hmm. Without realizing, as we read in Isaiah 46.10, declaring the end from the beginning. Now, what does that mean, declaring the end from the beginning? It means that the end is simply a replica of the beginning. And so, therefore, they have just taken that word, and evangelical Christianity has, has made it the end, and this is why we've had the Left Behind series and late great planet Earth and so forth. And what it has done is destroyed the meaning of that Greek word apocalyptic, which means the revelation, it means the unveiling and the uncovering of something that was truth at one time, but we forgot mm, or was lost. And so in Isaiah, where he said that he declared the end from the beginning, he also said, my counsel shall stand. In other words, this is the way the end is going to be. It's going to be exactly like the beginning. Mm -hmm. And what was the beginning? A perfect environment. Amen. Right. And so even uh, the scripture says in Revelation and other places that Jesus Christ is the end. So the end is Jesus Christ. Amen. The end is not hellfire and brimstone. The end is not the wrath of God. The end is not some judgment of God that people are going to be judged and then if they don't line up according to the standard, they're going to be cast into this eternal conscious hell. And so what I want to do tonight is begin to open up. In fact, you can go if you'd like to follow along in Romans chapter 16. Romans chapter 16. And one of the things which the church has been so really confused about is, as we've said before, the words judgment and wrath. And we found out, and remember in uh, 15 years ago at the uh, turn uh, uh, of the, when the millennium came in, 1999, I remember very few preachers got up and said anything against what was being preached and proclaimed at that time. Remember they said, well, you know, in the year 2000, you may wake up and not have any electricity. Remember that? Take all your money out of your bank. I remember yeah. telling the church in Portland, because I've been there 27 years, and this was like 15 years ago, I said, don't take a dime out of your bank. You're not going to wake up in the morning and not have electricity and not be able to, you know, live in the luxury that you're living in. Right. And uh, I, I remember that as mm. well as it happened yesterday. And many were saying, well, you know, uh, America is going to become like a third world country. And all kind of doomsday yeah, right. prophecies were going forth. And they had to stop. Some of them ap ap uh, actually stopped and said, oops, saith the Spirit. Right. Oops, saith the Lord. We right. got the date wrong. But I noticed some of them continue to set dates. And you know yeah. what? They're mm -hmm. still doing it. When are we going to wake when up in evangelical not? Christianity and quit setting dates? Right. And realize the end is what? It's a replica of the beginning. The end is Jesus Christ. Yeah. So what I want to talk about tonight as we begin to read here in uh, Romans chapter 16, I want us to understand something that I think is very, very important. We have to keep the order of interpretation correct. And what I mean by that is when we look at all of the incarnational events of Jesus, what do I mean by incarnational events of Jesus? The incarnational events of Jesus would be from his virgin birth 
his life, his ministry, his death, his burial, his resurrection, his ascension, and his seating. So what I want us to understand is, and we have not really understood this because we haven't seen the big picture, but the incarnational events of Jesus Christ, and especially the cross, was not because man failed. It was not because man partook of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. The controlling story of the incarnation was not man's issues or man's failure. Not at all. But you see, that's what evangelical Christianity has taught. We have interpreted these events of Jesus, especially the cross, the death, the burial, the resurrection, as God sending Jesus Christ to remedy a situation. And it wasn't that at all. And so what we need to begin to see is the apocalyptic disclosure of Jesus Christ was to reveal the love of the Father to reveal the heart of God that always was from before the foundation of the world. In other words, let me say it this way, make it a little simpler. When Jesus went to the cross in his death, burial, and resurrection, he did not bring us benefits. He did not bring forgiveness. He did not bring righteousness. He did not bring holiness. But he revealed something that was true of the Father and true of us, the way the Father saw us, Otherwise, you know, the father wouldn't have said to Adam when he partook of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil, who told you you were this way? Because the father always saw us as one. He always saw us as one. And, you know, one of the things that's really been made real to me is the fact that God never really even had to forgive us. God, who is love, never had to forgive us. Can you imagine, you know, he tells us, Amen. blessed is he that's not offended in anything, and then he's offended and has to forgive us. Amen. And so Jesus Christ has to go shed his blood to pay the price mm. to give God something so he can forgive us. Mm -hmm. There's no, there has, I don't even believe that's a thought in the mind of God. How could, how could love ever have a thought of having to forgive? Now, the reason we see scriptures that talk about forgiveness is because we needed it. Amen. We needed to know that we were forgiven because we were the ones that had the awareness of unforgiveness and so forth. <laughs> and so what I want to point out is it's vital that we understand that the incarnational events that we see recorded in the scripture, mm. we need to see the apocalyptic disclosure. And what's the apocalyptic disclosure? It's the unveiling of something that was always true, but we forgot when we came here or it was lost. And so, again, God did not, and Jesus Christ did not go to the cross because of man's failure. Now, we've been taught that. All of us have been taught that all of our lives, that God sent Jesus to the cross, or if they don't say God sent Jesus to the cross, they say, well, he went to the cross to remedy a situation, to make us right, to make us holy, to forgive us of our sin. No, it was to reveal something that was already true. Now, in Romans chapter 16, verses 25 and 26, we're going to look at the apocalyptic disclosure of Christ, and we're going to see how the, that is the controlling factor of the incarnation. Let me say that again. We're going to look at the apocalyptic disclosure of Christ to be the controlling factor of why Jesus came, mm -hmm. not to remedy a situation. Romans chapter 16, verse 25 says, Now to him that is of power to establish you according to my gospel and the preaching of Jesus Christ according to the revelation. Now the New King James says according to the revealing. According to the revealing of the mystery which was kept secret since the world began. Now notice the phrase there which was kept secret since the world began. That wasn't because God was holding something back from man. It was because man did not have the understanding and the perception to see the mystery. You see, man wasn't at that place that he could see the mystery yet. So let me read those two verses together, 25 and 26. Now to him that is of the power to establish you according to my gospel and the preaching of Jesus Christ according to the revelation or the revealing, the apocalyptic revealing of the mystery which was kept secret since the world began. But now, but now, when is now? Back then, when Christ came to the earth, but now is made manifest, and by the scriptures of the prophets, according to the commandment of the everlasting God, made known to all nations for the obedience of faith. So, 
Paul here is referring to his gospel because he had the revelation of the gospel, the death, burial, and resurrection. So he calls it my gospel. And what he's saying here is simply that the gospel, which is synonymous with Jesus Christ coming, the incarnational events of Jesus from, as I said, his virgin birth to his being seated at the right of the Father, that was to reveal something that had been hidden from before the foundation of the world. So notice he says here, the gospel and the preaching of Jesus Christ is the apocalyptic revelation of the mystery. Notice, since the world began, but when Jesus came to this earth, or now is made manifest, so the apocalyptic revelation of the mystery since the world began was revealed and was made known when Jesus Christ came to the earth. Now, it does not say that he brought righteousness. It does not say that he brought our holiness. What it says is that it was revealed. I'm going to look at a lot of scriptures tonight that show us that when he came, the incarnational events took place not because of man's failure, not because Adam partook of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil and we fell into sin and death, but because something was always true that needed to be revealed about us. Now, in 2 Corinthians, I'm just going to uh, quote this, but you can go to 1 Corinthians 2 if you'd like. In 2 Corinthians 5, 19, it says these words, God, now listen carefully, God was in Christ Jesus reconciling the world unto himself. Now let me change one word. Instead of world, let me say us. For God was in Christ Jesus reconciling us unto himself. Notice it did not say that God was reconciled to us. We were reconciled to him. God didn't need to be reconciled to us. God was never mad. He never had anything against us. He never saw us separate. As I said uh, earlier tonight, uh, that's why he could look at Adam and say, Adam, who told you you were naked? Who told you you were unrighteous? Who told you you were perishing? Who told you you were a sinner? That's really what he was saying. Because when Adam partook of that tree of the knowledge of good and evil that God told him not to partake of, he fell in his understanding. He took upon himself a sense of separation, and he saw himself that way. So therefore, you know, where the mind goes, the man follows, or as a man thinketh in his heart, so is he. That became his experience. And ever since then, that has been mankind's experience until man awakens to the spiritual reality of the oneness that he's always had. So God was not reconciled to us there in 2 Corinthians 5, 17, where it says God was in Christ Jesus reconciling the world or reconciling us unto himself. It was us being reconciled to him, not him being reconciled to us because he was never mad. He never had anything against us. Now, in 1 Corinthians chapter 2 and verse 7, Paul here is talking, as in Romans, about the gospel here. And he says in verse 7, But we speak the wisdom of God in a mystery, even the hidden wisdom which God ordained, notice, before the foundation, or before the world, unto our glory. Now notice the word ordained there. We speak the wisdom of God in a mystery, even the hidden wisdom which God ordained. Ordained means predestined, predetermined. Pre means something that was before. So notice we speak the gospel of God, but we speak the wisdom of God, which is the gospel of God in a mystery, even the hidden wisdom or the gospel, which was predestined or predetermined or ordained before the world or before the ages unto our glory. Now notice it doesn't say unto his glory, unto our glory. Because, you see, we fell from that glory. Because that was the mindset or that was the awareness that we had. So that glory had to be restored. The revelation of the glory, that we were in the glory from before the foundation, had to be restored unto us. Now, what are we doing? We're simply looking at these scriptures. We're looking at the apocalyptic disclosure, again, to be the controlling factor of the incarnation rather than human failure being the controlling story or the controlling factor of the incarnation. In other words, Jesus came to this earth to reveal the love of the Father. Not to make us righteous or holy or even to forgive us, we'll see. Now, haven't we all been taught that? Mm -hmm. Absolutely. Yep. Jesus came and he hung on a cross, you know, to make us the righteousness of God in Christ Jesus. Mm -hmm. 
And we're going to look at a lot of these scriptures that seem to be saying that just with a surface reading or a cursory reading. But he really came to the earth to reveal the Father. Now, here again in 1 Corinthians 2, 7, the gospel is the wisdom of God predestinated for man's glory before time began, before the foundation of the world. Now, again, we were taught, you know, all about the garden, all about a talking snake and all about a tree of the knowledge of good and evil, how God told Adam, don't eat of this tree and so forth. We have been taught that and the fact that Adam did eat and so God had a problem on his hands. He had to come up with a solution. And so the solution was that he would kill a son in penal substitution. He would kill a son. Mm -hmm. uh, the blood would be shed and that would be a type of an antidepressant to change his mood about us or turn his frown upside down or turn him back to his factory settings. Mm -hmm. And that's what the evangelical Christian community has been teaching. In other words, God needed to remedy a situation. There needed to be some change in God. Wow. Amen. Some things needed to be changed. Then this is what they, what, what they minister here. And let me say it this way. God wasn't need conscious. Mm -hmm. He was never controlled by needs. God was never sin conscious. Why would he tell us not to be sin conscious or need conscious? And then he is, right? Mm -hmm. Why would he tell us, uh, you know, and say, blessed is he that's not offended in anything. And then he's all offended. Mm -hmm. Right. <laughs> and need someone to pay a price, you know, so he can get rid of his offense. Yeah, I think I gave the example before how that, you know, someone owes me a large sum of money and they can't pay. And then someone comes along and says, well, I'll pay it for them. Well, that, that would not be forgiveness on my part for the person that owed me. See? So God didn't need a payment to forgive us because unforgiveness could never be in the mind of one who is love could never be in the mind of one who is loved. Now, Ephesians chapter 1. Ephesians chapter 1. I don't know if this is helping anyone, but I'll tell you what. It has revolutionized my thinking uh, to a great degree. And, and I love this stuff because what we're doing is we're really beginning to see God, our Father. I don't even like to say God. Our Father, Abba, the way He really is and has always been. We'll begin, and you know, what will that do for us? Well, number one, and one of the reasons I'm teaching this is, you know, Isaiah said in Isaiah 118, come let us reason together. We need to think some things through. Amen. Instead of just swallow everything hook, line, and sinker that every person, you know, that calls himself a preacher or a teacher has told us. And secondly, we express the God that we worship. So if we have a vindictive, retributive God that's going to cast half the world in an eternal conscious torment or uh, a God that's going to judge the world retributively, then you see that's really at times what we express. Right. But when we really begin to get gripped by the fact that God is love, then that's what we begin to express. We no longer right. judge people by good and evil. That's right. We no longer see them by the appearance realm. I mean, our neighbor could be a total schnook and we can still look through mm -hmm. their actions and we can see the love of the Father within them. I believe that the seed of God is in every man. Mm -hmm. Whether or not you know they are walking in that and experiencing that, the seed of God is in every man. And we were never taught that. Amen. We were never taught no. that. No. Now, one of the things that this teaching will also do is show us that if this happened from before the foundation, then it's not based on man's choice. Right. We were chosen, and we're going to look at it right here in Ephesians 1. We were even saved from before the foundation. But you see, evangelical Christianity has made it all about man's choice. Right. Mm. Now, don't misunderstand. I believe that we do agree with it mm -hmm. in order to experience it. But the truth is the truth whether we're experiencing it or not. Right. The truth is the truth whether Amen. we're experiencing and walking in it or not. So you see, it's not based upon man's, you know, and evangelical Christianity has taught us you've got to walk the green mile of the altar, got to confess your sins, accept Jesus into your heart. Mm -hmm. You see, and, and listen, God met people there. Certainly, I'm not, I'm not making light of that. God, you know, he meets us where we are, but thank God we're beginning to awaken and we're beginning to lift the incarnational events into a higher dimension, and that's going to cause us to experience a greater experience in him. A more consistent experience. Now, yeah. Ephesians chapter 1, uh, verses 4 and 5, and then we'll read 7 through 10. But notice what it says in verse 4, Ephesians 1, according as he hath, notice that word is past tense, he hath 
chosen us in him and how many know that Christ Jesus was in God from before the foundation when he came to this earth he was what God manifested in the flesh mm -hmm. so he was in Christ Jesus so as he hath according as he hath past tense chosen us in him in Christ notice when before the foundation of the world that we should be holy and without blame before him in love so I was chosen you were chosen you were saved you were made holy you are without blame you never ever had any wrinkles now us who are a little bit older we love that we're a church without spot blemish or wrinkle don't have any wrinkles tonight Amen. isn't that great but we never did mm -hmm. we never did so he saved us he chose us he made us holy without blame from before in love from before the foundation verse 5 having predestinated us to the adoption of children new king james says the adoption of sons by jesus christ to himself according to the good pleasure listen to this of his will not not our will and it was a pleasure for him to save us it was a pleasure for him to choose us it was a pleasure for him to make us holy and without blame in him in love from before the foundation that was God's pleasure that was God's will now jump on down to verse 7 7 through 10 in whom in Jesus Christ we have redemption through his blood the forgiveness of sins according to the riches of his grace wherein he hath abounded past tense toward us in all wisdom and prudence having made known unto us the mystery of his will according to his good pleasure which we read in verse 5 which he hath purposed in himself that in the dispensation of the fullness of times he might gather together in one all things in Christ both which are in heaven and which are on earth even in him now here's what I want us to see normally when we would go to verse 7 we would say okay in him we have redemption through his blood and forgiveness of sins according to the riches of his grace and we would identify that with the cross and we would identify that with the crucifixion we'd identify that with him shedding his blood as it says there and we would identify or we would view that again as God's response to human failure to the fall something needed to be done and we would relate that only to the historical event of the cross that Good Friday day because of man's failure because of man partaking of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil because of all men falling into sin but now going back to verses 4 and 5 he presents the apocalyptic disclosure first first he said first it's from before the foundation that he chose us he saved us made us holy without blemish so he he reveals or he presents the apocalyptic disclosure first and the, then he makes it to be the controlling story or the controlling factor of the incarnation in this passage in other words he chose us according to his pleasure not because of man's sin or man's fall because he began there in verses 4 and 5 and he said the gospel is this is the gospel that man was hath past tense was chosen in Christ from before the foundation of the world now that's the good news of the gospel right there Amen. and he predestinated us to be adopted as sons according to the New King James as sons according to the good will of his pleasure now that's the apocalyptic disclosure right there that is and what is the apocalyptic disclosure apocalypse means what to unveil to uncover something that was always true from before the foundation but we lost it or we forgot it when we came here now then down in verses 7 through 10 we're told that a certain event expressed or made known this truth so in him we have redemption of sins not based upon a historical event that took place but based upon having been chosen from before the foundation of the world mm -hmm. so you see we've looked at forgiveness and we have treated it as though it was non-existent before the cross hello we have looked at holiness and we have acted like it was in non-existence before the cross and righteousness but you know it tells us that our father was Jehovah Rapha the help of my body before the cross before Jesus bore the stripes Exodus chapter 15 the scripture tells me that Jesus Christ revealed the fact and we're just lifting the cross we're not putting the cross down we're lifting it to a higher dimension Jesus Christ revealed that Jehovah said canoe was always my righteousness Amen. but yes. if I make 
it a historical event that it was not existent from before. Forgiveness is not something that just popped up, you know, when Jesus went to the cross and it was necessary, you know, for us to have it made known to us. Yes, I'll agree with you there. But forgiveness didn't just pop up at the cross. Jesus didn't go to the cross because of man's failure. He went to the cross to reveal his appearing on earth was to reveal the love of the Father. Mm. Because verse 9 there says, having made known the mystery. Verse 7 also says, having made known the mystery. So the apocalyptic disclosure is that Jesus, in some historical event and in his incarnational events from his virgin birth until he was seated to the right of the Father, did not bring these benefits of the Father to us, but revealed them and showed us that we had them from before the foundation of the world. God always was. Someone says, well, God is a judge. Well, but before he's judge, and Scripture does say that, that he is judge, but before he was judge, he was love. Amen. And see, the problem has been we've looked at judgment, we've looked at wrath, and we have not seen right. that judgment is just a determination and to declare and to decree. And we studied all that in Romans and in chapter 1 mm -hmm. from the creation of the world. You know, he made a decree. And then we found out that the wrath of God was not his anger. He, he doesn't know, he's not even capable of, thinking of anger or unforgiveness mm -hmm. but his wrath was his his passion his desire mm -hmm. his longing one of the meanings is covet he coveted after us he mm -hmm. loved us always loved us and always longed for us now another one is colossians 1 26 so i want us to understand tonight that the controlling factor of the incarnation was not man's failure but as it says what was the controlling factor the fact that it was God's good pleasure from before the foundation. It was his good pleasure and his will from before the foundation to reveal the fact that God never was mad at us. He never saw us separate. He always was our righteousness. He always was the health of our bodies. He always was everything. But we forgot it. We lost it. So apocalyptic means to reveal truth that has been forgotten or lost. Now, Colossians 1 and verse 26 Colossians 1, verse 26, begins by saying, even the mystery. Now, what is the mystery? Well, the mystery is the gospel. Mm -hmm. So anytime you see the word mystery, you can just realize here that he's referring to the good, good news. The good, good news. The good news that was hidden from man because of his fallen state and his fallen perception, but revealed then through the appearing of the Lord Jesus Christ when he came to this world. So, verse 26, even the mystery. Colossians 1, 26, even the mystery... Notice, which has been hid, always was there, which has been hid from ages and from generations, but now is made manifest. New King James says, but now is revealed to his saints. Now let me say something about the word saints there. It's not church folks. It's not Lutherans or Catholics or Presbyterians or Pentecostals or Charismatics. Saints there means the sacred ones. And it means all those who are sacred to God. And have always been sacred to God. And who is sacred to God? Well, all oh. men. John 3, 16, For God so loved the world, not the church. Mm -hmm. He commanded his love toward us. You know, in that while we were sinners, what? Or thought we were sinners, didn't have a clue about our identity, and that's all that a sinner means. See, he, he, came, to, he came to reveal something to saints, sacred ones, which means all men. So here's what this is saying here in Colossians 1.26. The good news, which has been hidden from ages and generations, but now has been revealed to his sacred ones, is what? The revelation, the apocalyptic revelation, unveiling, uncovering of something that was always true but was lost, is Christ in us, the hope of glory. He's always been in us. He didn't just pop in us and jump in us. You know, I, I, you know, this is, you know, may sound a little carnal, but I used to even, even as a, uh, uh, maybe in my twenties or thirties, being in in the evangelical Christian church, you know, the full gospel, so, a uh, so-called church, I always wondered how, you know, how does this happen when people walk the green mile of the aisle and they accept Jesus as their savior? Does he just somehow jump in, or how does that work? <laughs> you know, well, he's always been there. Mm -hmm. He's always been there. Spirit of man is the candle of the Lord. You know, the, the, the candle gets lit, if you will, if I can say it that way. That which is within man is just ignited and is just lit. You can really say he gets lit. He has an experience of being lit. 
But there's no Jesus jumping in him. Christ was, he was always in Christ. You know, Christ was always in him. So what has been from before now, he's saying here, has been revealed. Christ in you, the hope of glory, which was always from before. This is the apocalyptic disclosure. He's declaring that which has been from everlasting to everlasting. It's always been true, but we forgot it. We lost it. And so the incarnational events... When Jesus came to this earth, he came to reveal these things. He didn't come as a result of man's failure. He right. came to reveal something that was always true of us. Now, yeah. 2 Timothy chapter 1. Well, this gets gooder and gooder. Yeah. 2 Timothy chapter 1, verses 9 and 10. <clears throat> and this says basically what we read back in, uh, in the last one that we just read says basically the same thing, but just with a little different wording. 2 Timothy 1, verses 9 and 10. Notice what it says. Who hath, again, past tense, hath is past tense, who hath saved us and called us with an holy calling, not according to our works, but according to his own purpose and grace, which was given us in Christ Jesus before... The world began. Now, notice the phrase there, not according to our works. Now, that doesn't necessarily mean not according to our works of obeying some law or some rule. But what I believe this is saying, where it says not according to our works, what, what I believe this is saying is that this had nothing to do with a response to man's failure. Mm -hmm. In other words, Jesus did not come because man fell. He came to reveal something that was always true. So not according to our works is not talking about obeying some law, but what it is saying is that the gospel didn't have anything to do with the response to man's fall or man's failure whatsoever. That is not the reason God called us and saved us. It wasn't man's problem. It was not because of man's problem. It was because of God's pleasure, his will from before the foundation of the world. Now, Notice what it says at the end there, again, of, of uh, verse 9, which was given us in Christ Jesus before the world began, verse 10, but is now made manifest or revealed by the appearing of our Savior, Jesus Christ. So he has saved us, not as a result of responding to man's fall, but according to what? According to his own purpose and grace, he had this plan for man from before the foundation. And the plan was what? The plan was that when Jesus would come, he would reveal to us the love of the Father Amen. and the purpose and the plan of God from before the foundation of the Amen. world. So once again, it says here, he called us, he saved us, not because of man's fall, not according to our works of sin that we fell into when Adam partook of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil, but according to his own purpose and grace, which was given, not earned, not earned, which was given, it was a gift, us in Christ Jesus before the world began. So what do we have here? We have the apocalyptic disclosure. Jesus came to reveal that. Verse 10, but is now made manifest or revealed by what? By his appearing. By his appearing. So his purpose and grace is revealed to us through the appearing of Jesus Christ. So what was the appearing to do? The appearing was simply to reveal, not to save us. Hello. I know that's tight, but it's right. Mm -hmm. Not to save us, not to make us righteous, not to make us holy, not to bring any of the benefits of the Father to us, but simply to reveal them to us. So now, as a result of this, we're seeing that the gospel is not subject to the appearing, but rather the events of the appearing or confirmation that the gospel always was. That's good news. See, because we thought that the gospel was subject to the appearing. In other words, when Jesus appeared on the scene, the gospel was brought to earth. But no, the gospel is what the appearing confirmed. The gospel is not something that just suddenly showed up on the stage of history after man had messed up so badly. He always was. The gospel always was. Jesus Christ always was. The Father always was love. Now, 1 Peter chapter 1. I'm giving you a lot of scriptures tonight, but mm -hmm. I, I want us to look at this. 1 Peter chapter 1, verses 18 through 20. Now, this one here, when we get into verse 19, 
it's kind of a reverse here. In fact, I wish they would have put verse 20 at the end of verse 18, but they didn't. And so this is what kind of trips up a lot of people when they, when they read it in this order. But I'll explain this as we go through this. 1 Peter 1, 18 through 20, For as much as ye know that ye were not redeemed with corruptible things as silver and gold from your vain conversation. Now, the New King James says, You were not redeemed... You are not redeemed with corruptible things as silver and gold from your aimless conduct of sin. Mm -hmm. I like that. For as much as you know that you were not redeemed with corruptible things as silver and gold from your, from your aimless conduct of sin. Mm -hmm. You see, that had nothing to do with it. Man's fall had nothing to do with, with redemption. Mm -hmm. It was the purpose and the pleasure of God. Redemption was God's will and God's purpose and God's pleasure. It was his pleasure to reveal that. So, let me read that again from the King James. For as much as ye know that ye were not redeemed with corruptible things as silver and gold from your vain conversation or from your aimless conduct of sin, received by tradition from your fathers. Now, that sounds a little like redemption was all about our aimless conduct, which were received, you know, from Adam on down, you know, through the fathers. That's what it sounds like there. But that's really not what it's saying when we read on. Verse 19, But with the precious blood of Christ... As of a lamb without blemish and without spot, verse 20 here, who verily was foreordained, predestined before the foundation of the world, but was manifest or revealed in these last times for you. So if you're not careful, you can read this here and you could, you know, get the idea that the evangelical church has about this, that humanity received some futile way of life from our forefathers and so God needed to respond to that. But God didn't need to respond to that through Jesus going to the cross. But the revelation is still, this is still the apocalypse, uh, apocalypsis or the apocalyptic disclosure that the controlling factor of the incarnation was not man's fall. Mm -hmm. I'm going to say that all night tonight. Because you know what? That's an important point for us to get. Jesus did not come to earth because man had messed up so horribly. And we were so bad. He came to reveal the love of the Father. There's no thought of unrighteousness or separation or unforgiveness. How could love even have one thought of that? Absolutely. He's, God is, our Father is not capable of having a thought Amen. of sinner, of perishing, of separate, where we're concerned. He never did. Hmm. Hebrews chapter 4 verse 3. We did, folks. Amen. He gave his life for us. What for? To reveal the love of the, the Father to the us. Father. See? God didn't need the cross. We needed the cross. Amen. Hello? Mm -hmm. God didn't need the cross. We needed the cross. Amen. And thank God for the cross. Amen. We're not taking away from the cross. What we're doing is we're lifting it into a higher dimension of reality mm -hmm. and to Amen. correctly inform people of the actual interpretation of those occurrences that have already taken place that took place from before the foundation. You know, I made a statement not long ago in one of the messages. Maybe I said it here. I don't know. But you, you can look at Jesus when he bore, before he went to the cross, and, and they, they beat him with a cat of nine tails. And the scripture says in, uh, I think it's 1 Peter 2, 24, by his stripes ye were healed. And I like, I was reading that one day, and the word were, W-E-R-E, -E, just kind of lit up in my scripture. Mm. By whose stripes you were Past tense, healed. Mm. And what came to me was, if we look at that as something that he just brought at that historical event mm. in time, mm -hmm. rather than lifting it into the higher dimension that my father always was the health of my body, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. if I'm looking at it like it says, actually the King James in uh, Exodus 15 says, I'm the Lord thy God or the Lord that healeth thee, but the Greek, or the Hebrew there says, I am the Lord your health. Now, if we look at it, I'm the Lord that healeth thee, and you don't experience that in your body, you may think, oh, what have I done? I haven't had enough faith, this, that. But when you realize and you lift this into a higher dimension and you see that my Father is the health of my body, then it's not dependent upon what I do or don't do or whether I'm pleasing to Him or not. He is, period, the health of my body. And I just stand on that. Amen. And he was the health of my body before my body even evolved here on this earth. Mm. See, he always was. That was settled in the heavenly realm from before the foundation. 
So what we're doing is we're not, again, we're not trying to minimize the cross, but we're simply lifting it into a higher dimension of reality so that we can see that when Jesus came, he came to reveal what was always true of us. Hebrews chapter 4, verse 3. Hebrews chapter 4 and verse 3. I was talking about forgiveness recently, and I said if you look up that word forgiveness in the Strong's, one of the meanings is grace, and God is a giver. He's a liver and he's a giver, right? Our Father is a liver and he's a giver. So like the word foreknowledge or foreordain or forgiveness, he's given us something from before. Mm-hmm. Hello? Can you hear that? Mm-hmm. For give, for knowledge, for ordain. He forgave, mm-hmm. you see, mm-hmm. before, the foundation. before the foundation. And it means give. He, he gives. He's into giving. He gave unto us. For from before. Mm-hmm. He never had to forgive us. That's, that was never even a mm-hmm. thought in his mind. Hebrews 4.3 <clears throat> We're the ones that needed to know we were forgiven. Hebrews 4, 3. For we which have believed do enter into rest, as he said, as I have sworn in my wrath. And again, that's the passionate love and longing and desire for us. I've sworn in my wrath. If they shall enter into my rest, although the works were finished from the foundation of the world. So I believe if we want to, and I know that we experience rest, you know, now. But I believe that there's coming a perfect rest in our experience when we can realize that this that we're talking about and this apocalyptic disclosure that Jesus revealed when he came was true of us from before the foundation. Mm -hmm. I believe that there will be a rest that we will experience that will be like fruit that remains. It'll be a rest that remains. It won't Mm -hmm. be one day I'm resting and the next day I'm maybe not resting quite as Mm -hmm. securely as I did the day before. I believe this will bring a total rest in our experience, not overnight, but as we are, you know, gripped by this, as, as these things become a reality unto us. So, so he's talking here about the rest. He says, let me read that again, Hebrews 4, 3. For we which have believed do enter into rest, as he said, as I have sworn in my wrath, if they shall enter into my rest. And notice how he's not connecting a rest so much that Jesus brought... If they shall enter into my rest, although the works were finished from the foundation of the world. So Jesus revealed in his resurrection, his death, burial, resurrection, that there was a rest that we could experience Amen. as we come to this understanding that that rest was really given from before the foundation of the world. Mm-hmm. See, if we can believe that, if we can, if we can see Amen. these things that we're talking about. But yeah. Jesus didn't go to the cross because of man's failure. It was the purpose and the plan of God from before the foundation. Mm-hmm. And yeah. Jesus just simply revealed what was yeah. always true of us. See, we just, we just, when Adam partook of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil, he dropped in his perception and his understanding, mm-hmm. and he began to live like that. Right. And remember, God came and said, Adam, where are you? It wasn't because God didn't know. He wanted Adam to know that, hey, Adam, you've, you've yeah. done something here. And you're living out of a different life source than the tree of life now. Mm-hmm. And so what happened was every man from that point on, and I'll tell you what, religion has really enforced this within us. Mm-hmm. Every man from that point on, we came here and we had forgotten. We came here and we had forgotten who we always were from before the foundation. And so therefore, what? We live that way. Mm-hmm. Where the mind goes, the man follows. As a man thinks in his heart, so is it. We lived as though we were in Adam. And, and really, I'm not saying we never were in Adam. We were in Adam because we thought we were in Adam. Where the mind goes, the man follows. See, if you think you're a certain way, or if you think that there's something that's inaccessible to you, well, then it's inaccessible to you. You'll not experience it. But once we awaken to the reality, well, then we can experience who we've always been. Now, 1 John chapter 4, 1 John chapter 4, verses 16 through 18. 1 John chapter 4, and and this is one that uh, people just really have a lot of fear over, and and especially today with people saying, well, you know, the end of the world's going to be today, and Mm -hmm. those that are involved in the four blood moons and uh, all of the uh, holy days that uh, 
you know, they're mm -hmm. trying to celebrate today. See, Jesus fulfilled all of that. Right. You know, Paul the Apostle said in Galatians, don't let any man judge you according to new moon, Sabbath, holy days, and all that sort of mm -hmm. a thing. Jesus took care of all of that. He fulfilled all of that, and he revealed to us that all of that was fulfilled. Now, in 1 John 4, 16, it says, and we have known and believed. Now, notice two things here, knowing and believing. We have known and believed or been persuaded. We have known and been persuaded of the love that God hath to us. God is love, and he that dwelleth, or the New King James says, he that abideth in love dwelleth in God, and God in him. Now, notice verse 17. Herein is our love made perfect, mm -hmm. that we may have boldness or confidence in, notice when, the day of judgment. The day of judgment. Because as he is, so are we in this world. Now, the we here, that we may have boldness, refers to all men, not just Christians who've done the right thing, said the right prayer, you know, live a certain way. It's talking about all Christians, and of course, I, or all, all people, excuse me, all people. And of course, I'm not coming against Christians, of course, you know, that have prayed the prayer and, you know, are seeking to live by the Spirit. I'm not taking away from that. I'm just simply saying the we here has to do with all men. Because all men, listen, the majority of people tonight are scared to death of some coming event called a retributive judgment or the wrath of God that's soon to hit this planet. Now, look at verse 18. There is no fear in love. See, when we see that the Father is love, there is no fear in love, but perfect love casteth out fear, because fear hath torment. And the Greek says punishment. Fear hath punishment. He that feareth is not made perfect in love. So here's what I want us to realize. There's boldness and confidence, notice, in the day of judgment. Now, what is that, what is that referring to there, the day of judgment? And how is that going to be experienced it's going to be experienced as we come to understand that the judgment, the righteous judgment of God, remember in Romans chapter 1, we talked about from the creation of the world in verse 20, what was the righteous judgment of God? It was to determine, to decide, and to decree. So he determined in Genesis 1.26, let us make man in our image after our likeness. He decreed to Adam, he said, Adam, don't partake of this tree of the knowledge of good and evil, or dying thou shalt die. But notice that first judgment in Genesis 1.26, let us make man in our image after our likeness. Look what it says at the end of verse 17 here in 1 John chapter 4. Notice how he connects the day of judgment to as he is, so are we in this world. Why? Because the day of judgment happened to be, the righteous judgment happened to be when God said in Genesis 1.26, let us make man in our image after his likeness. So hence... As he is, so are we in this world. Now, it's interesting. I, I looked up this word day here, and it means tame, gentle, and to sit. Now, in one place, it meant, it was the word apocalyp apocalypsis. It meant, it meant the day of, I think it was talking about the day of wrath, and it meant to reveal the wrath of God. So what does it mean, the apocalyptus? or the apocalypsis, or the apocalyptic revealing of wrath, is when we see that wrath is God's passionate love for us. Mm. See, So here the word day is gentle, it means to sit. So listen, the revealing of the day of judgment is associated with sitting, or is associated with rest rather than being tormented, rather than being fearful, as most are tonight when they see the phrase day of judgment or the day of God's wrath. See, and it's all based on the fact that when we understand that he is love, then what? Then this day of judgment has to be something that is a good thing. It's not a bad thing. It's not retributive judgment. It's righteous judgment. And again, that is what? To determine, to decide, and to decree. And he did that in Genesis. And here, when he talks about the day of judgment, he said, what is he saying? As he is, so are we in this world. And he's talking about love here. So he's connecting the fact that God is love with this day of judgment, this gentle day, this tame day, uh, to sit. In other words, when you understand the love of God, you'll rest in the judgment that has already been decreed. Amen. 
let us make man in our image after his likeness. Mm -hmm. And as he is, so are we in this world. He's connecting all of that to the love of God and the day, the gentle day. See, that judgment is revealed to us as, as the righteous judgment, with it, which is gentle and which is tame and causes us to sit or causes us to rest. Now, Hebrews chapter 4, verse 16. Let me add this one to the one we just read here in 1 John chapter 4. <clears throat> Hebrews chapter 4 and the 16th verse. Hebrews chapter 4 and verse 16. <clears throat> Very familiar verse of scripture here. We could probably all quote this. But I want us to see this. It says, Let us therefore come boldly or confidently unto the throne of grace that we may obtain mercy and find grace to help in time of need. Now, could this be what most people dread when they talk and they teach from the book of Revelation and they see where it talks about the great white throne judgment? Because listen, folks, there's only one throne. There's only one throne. And the great white throne judgment, and we're going to talk about those scriptures later on, not tonight, but later, that talk about we stand before the judgment seat of Christ or, or, or we, uh, we, are, uh, we appear before the judgment seat of Christ. There's two scriptures that talk about that. So I believe what he's talking about here, when he says, come confidently unto the throne of grace, this throne is this great white throne that Revelation talks about. And, and what is the great white throne judgment? We'll deal with that a little bit more as we look at some of these scriptures here. But what this is saying is, see, there can be no greater time of need than when someone declares to you, oh, the end is going to happen. It's soon to happen. So how do you come boldly to this throne of grace? We come boldly to this throne of grace, or we come boldly when people start talking about the wrath of God and the judgment of God by realizing Isaiah 46, 10, I declare the end from the beginning. In other words, the end is going to be simply what? The beginning push forward to the Amen. end. The beginning is a replica, a reduplication of the end. So therefore, we can come boldly to this great white throne judgment or we can come boldly to the throne of grace and receive help in time of need. A lot of people tonight need some help in the time of need, because right now they think that this thing is going to end badly. And they don't realize, you see, that his judgment and his wrath and the end is all a good thing. Jesus declared himself to be the end. So the end can't be this world, you know, this earth blown up to smithereens. The end has to be that a people experience the beginning. And aren't we beginning to wake up and experience what it was like in the beginning? In fact, you know people say well you know we're going to experience what Adam experienced in the garden well I think we're going to experience that plus mm -hmm. I think we're going to experience the Genesis chapter 1 <clears throat> where God said let us make man our image after our likeness now I don't have scripture to back that up but I just seem to think that you know there's, it's going to be even greater than what Adam experienced when we fully awaken and fully experience mm -hmm. what we're talking about so there's only one throne there's only one throne and the definition of the great white throne judgment has been taught so, so erroneously. And uh, we should be interpreting that great white throne judgment as this throne of grace that we just read about here that we can come boldly and confidently to to receive help in time of need. Now, one more scripture, Acts chapter 17 and verse 31. Acts chapter 17 and verse 31. You know, I shared with you some time ago how the 366 times... The scripture says, in one fashion or, or, or another, it says, fear not. 366 times. That's one for every day plus leap year. Isn't that what this message is all about? Fear Amen. not. There's no need for any type of a fear. For the future, for today, no fear. And, and what casts out fear? Perfect love. Knowing our Father as love. Knowing our Father as as perfect love. Now, Acts 17, 31, because he hath appointed a day in which he will judge the world in righteousness by that man whom he hath ordained, whereof he hath given assurance unto all men in that he hath raised him from the dead. Now, notice here, it, it talks about a day when all men were judged righteous in Christ. There was a day. 
And that day was before the foundation. It wasn't when Jesus went to the cross. But you see, when he was resurrected, notice what it says there, whereof he hath given assurance unto all men in that he hath raised him from the dead. So the raising of the dead brought a revelation, apocalyptic disclosure, which gave us boldness and gave us assurance mm -hmm. at the resurrection of the dead. Now, I do believe Jesus became sin. I believe he died spiritually. I believe he went into hell. But not to bring the benefits of the Father, mm -hmm. but to identify with who we thought we were and therefore became. Amen. In our experience, who we thought we were. When Jesus hung on the cross and he said, My God, my God, why hast thou forsaken me? What was he Amen. doing but identifying with our confusion? So Jesus at the cross identified with everything, you see, that we thought we were. And so what did that do when we see that he identified, or in other words, he absorbed all of that into himself that we thought we were and that we were experiencing because we thought we were that. What did that do? That then reveals to us something that took place from before the foundation of the world. It did not bring these things to us. And I think that's such an important point for us to understand. But it simply revealed the realities of the Father to us that were true from before the foundation of the world. Now, when you read that scripture that I started off with in uh, Isaiah chapter 4610, let me read that one more time in closing. It says, declaring the end from the beginning and from ancient times the things that are not yet done, saying, my counsel, now, another word there for counsel there is pleasure. In other words, my pleasure saying, my pleasure shall stand, and I will do all my pleasure. So what is he saying here? He is simply saying that I decreed and I declared that the end is going to be like the beginning. Amen. I said it, I decreed it, mm -hmm. I declared, and then he said, my counsel shall stand. My counsel, my pleasure, my counsel shall stand. In other words, my counsel is a faithful counsel. My purpose will never change because I will never change. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Amen. Declaring the end from the beginning and from ancient times of things that are not done. So even in our experience, what are we experiencing? You know, we've said many times that we were placed at the finish line. What is that saying? Just by saying we were placed at the finish line is saying that the beginning, you see, became the end. We were, the beginning, you see, became our end, became the finish line. So what we're experiencing today is what? What he said, declaring the end from the beginning. We're beginning to awaken, especially as we're awakened to this realization that Jesus Christ revealed the apocalyptic disclosure of all that that was true of us from before the foundation of the world then we're coming to realize that what we are experiencing today, which is the end of our salvation and redemption, was always from the beginning. Mm -hmm. It's the same thing. All those scriptures that we read, he saved us, he chose us, we're holy, we're blameless. All of that from before the foundation. Again, that's him declaring. He, that's because he declared, you see, the end, what we're experiencing today, from the beginning. And that's the good news. Because the beginning is what? From before the foundation. That's the beginning. And notice he said, how did he do this? By saying, mm -hmm. by decreeing, by saying, my counsel shall, shall stand and I will do all my pleasure. And guess what? He already did all his pleasure. He did that from before the foundation of the world. Mm -hmm. Now that's awesome mm -hmm. to understand that Jesus Christ did not come to bring the benefits of the Father, Amen. but revealed unto us something that was always true from before the foundation. That's an awesome revelation for us to receive. Awesome revelation. That it was all because of His pleasure. It was all because of His purpose. It was all because of His will from before the foundation that we're here today awakening Amen. and realizing that all of the incarnational events of Jesus Christ did not take place because of man's failure, but because of his purpose from before the foundation, because of his will. And listen, it was his pleasure. It was his pleasure. Thank God for the pleasure of the Lord. 
I'm thinking of a scripture right now that says the pleasure of the Lord shall prosper in his hand. Absolutely. Because Jesus, the hand, came to reveal the pleasure of the Lord that took place from before the foundation. Amen? Amen. Well, Father, we just thank you tonight for your presence, for your love. Thank you for the awakening, for the revelation, for opening our eyes to see, our ears to hear for our circumcised heart tonight, that we can embrace this word, this fresh word that you're bringing to each and every one of us. Thank you for Jesus. Thank you for the apocalyptic revelation and disclosure of who we were, even from before the foundation. Even though we came here and we forgot and it was lost, it's now being unveiled and uncovered. And we thank you for it. Thank you for the true teacher, the Holy Spirit, that is teaching us and quickening and making these realities real within our lives that we can walk in them and we can experience them. We thank you. We bless you in the name of the Lord. Amen. 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 And amen.